hopefully gone will be the days where you know someone can steal your sim card and steal your identity gone will be the days where someone can you know hack into your account with a password right now we're really at a loss for even authentication where most systems now are trying to authentic using two-factor authentication authenticate back to your email or authenticate back to your phone number because a lot of websites are like wow well our website's not secure enough so we're just going to assume someone's phone is secure we're going to assume you know google has it covered so we're going to assume that their email is secure Okay, so I'm happy to welcome back on the show, Ryan Condron, CEO of Titan Industries and creator of Lumion Protocol. Welcome back, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. So we had you on about a year and a half ago, obviously very different times then, especially you know, relative to kind of the main that you guys are working with Lumion. I would recommend we spent a lot of time going into Ryan and team's background on the previous episode. We'll do a quick recap here, but I'd recommend go back and listen to that and, and understand the Genesis story and how they arrived at Luma. And really today I'm looking forward to kind of catch up, I guess. You know, it's been a while rather than just do that privately, you know, let's turn it into a podcast episode. And there's lots of exciting stuff been going on, both in the wider Bitcoin ecosystem and then of course specific to Luma and your recent network launch around a hash power marketplace, which was always on the roadmap but kind of came off the ramp in September. So firstly, congratulations on that. I assume we still describe, you know, Lumerin as the world's first peer-to-peer low-cost decentralized marketplace for trading Bitcoin hash power. And Titan Mining effectively is a mining pool solutions as an alternative to Bitcoin miners who want to increase efficiency and scalability whilst maintaining a predictable and kind of flat cost. And of course, within the context of all of that is the debate around centralization in crypto, but specifically Bitcoin mining and, and how Lumerin and Titan combined offer an alternative to how Bitcoin mining can kind of increase its capabilities in a sustainable way. But as I said, we did a really great intro to you and the founding team as an origin story, but maybe quick recap, you know, 30 seconds, who is Ryan, and then we can go into of uh, Lumerin and, and I, I gotta say you did a you did a pretty good job. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take notes on how you introduced me. I'd have to introduce myself like that. No, my name is Ryan Condren. If you saw our first interview, uh, you know a little bit about me already. I got into Bitcoin mining in 2012. Pretty quickly started working on uh, mining pool space, profitability calculators, really anything around generation of the coins, uh, backing the networks. In 2017, we started seeing a trend pretty early of more and more centralization in the space where you'd start seeing large mining pools growing to over 50% of the network. They would start doing self-censorship. But as the industry grew more enterprise level, less of a hobby, there was less self-censorship, right? So it, it's really just grabbing as much market share as you can as quickly as possible. So we had to come up with a new pattern of how do we approach the future with hash power delivery in order to secure decentralization in the Bitcoin space and the mining space. And that's where the idea of Lumerin was born, the idea of hash power routing. So a miner with 100,000 devices in their facility can sell off the control of those devices. Uh, regardless where in the world the buyer is and where in the world the seller is, they can connect through a decentralized marketplace and they can actually take control of the hash power completely remotely, completely anonymously, and they can mine with it uh, against a pool of their choosing. The vision is uh, more people in the decision-making process around directing hash power will re-democratize Bitcoin. And that's that's kind of the slogan we're hammering right now is the re-democratization of Bitcoin. <laughs> Easier to say than spell, even though it's hard enough to say. <laughs> yeah. And look, I think, you know, I'm not sure how aware people are. I mean, we released this paper, God, I don't know. I think it's beginning of this year, actually, beginning of 23. I don't know when this podcast set goes out, it might be 24. So beginning of 23. And I think that was like the open metaverse under attack. And it was generally looking at ways in which crypto is being co-opted, compromised, centralized. In many ways, as it's reaching prime time, there's a greater requirement on scalability, efficiency, and all these things, which of course we welcome. But on the other hand, there's a huge amount of compromises in that process, ultimately leading to centralization, which ultimately leads to degrees of capture, state capture, state co-option, and censorship. And so 
you know, seeing what's happening with a lot of stable coins at the moment, you know, having to be a fact compliant with certain wallets, uh, revoking certain permissions. And of course, then centralization in Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, you know, there's a real risk that, you know, much of the promise or potential or the full potential, should we say, of, of Bitcoin and its role in a global economy can actually be realized. So that problem statement hasn't gone away. You know, you guys are here and I know you're tackling it. That problem statement hasn't gone away and maybe it's getting worse. It it is getting worse. And honestly, it doesn't matter what system you look at, whether it be the metaverse, whether it be artificial intelligence, whether it be Bitcoin mining, any system that wants to decentralize and bring sovereignty back to the individual and bring the choice back to the individual and ownership back to the individual is going to be under attack. And that's what we see time and time again. Governments do not like it when you mess with their monetary system. They do not like it when you when they mess with the data that they like to be able to control and to censor. And we even saw here in the US, you know, Biden signing a bill allowing AI censorship and controls around that. It's really just going to keep getting worse. So any type of ecosystem, even in the metaverse, you will start seeing greater and greater amounts of censorship. And that's, you know, for me, for Bitcoin mining, I really see it as the line in the sand to draw of how do we protect this network from being taken over from governments, from entities, and keeping it tamper resistant. Um, And that's really hard to do from the advent of the ASIC. You know, originally we saw a lot of these altcoins try to be ASIC resistant. So they're constantly changing up their algorithm. They're trying to change up the way the network functioned in order to avoid ASICs. Because the, the vision was that once ASICs entered a network, it became specialized hardware and not everyone would be able to access specialized hardware. And therefore, the network was on a course for centralization. And that's exactly what we're seeing with Bitcoin, with just about any ecosystem that has ASICs. But even furthermore, with ecosystems that went proof of stake, we're seeing greater centralization just around economics, where the moment Ethereum went proof of stake, you saw you know Coinbase and Binance being the, the two most powerful entities on earth in the Ethereum ecosystem. So you know, for us, we're looking at what can we do to keep Bitcoin secure moving forward. And that's where we really think Lumeran shines. Now, the other ecosystems like uh, AI and the metaverse, they're still uh, looking for a solution for how do we keep those fully decentralized and censorship resistant. Yeah, and they've got to figure that out, right? But I think, I mean, the point is, yes, some entities have begun to self-censor. But I think there's also the argument that, look, even if you wanted to resist, by the point you reach a certain level of scale, you naturally have to have people physically based somewhere. You have to have a company operating that. And the bigger you are, the more of a risk you are and the easier you are to capture, right? And we saw this with Facebook and Libra and everything else that you know, it's just impossible for them to even get it off the ground. And so the point is not necessarily that these the kind of whales in a network or the whales in mining or, you know, the, the dominant forces there that are acquiring market share, you know, entirely legitimately, they may want to be able to be able to say, you know, like Apple does with the iPhone, hey, sorry, you know, we can't open it for you. Uh, you know, we can't center a transaction for you. And I think that's interesting about Lumen is you, you offer the opportunity to both the retail participant in the network, but then also the larger centralized players to be able to say, hey, look, you know, We don't know the transactions that we're processing. We can't censor them, right? We're just contributing hash power to the network. That's exactly right. The vision is if we can treat miners as utilities where they produce this commodity called hash power and they don't use their commodity, they sell off the commodity to the open grid, the open market for other people to use. You know, any player in the space that makes themselves large enough, they will become a target, right? We saw that with Facebook, right? When they, exactly what you said, the moment they tried to launch their own cryptocurrency or get into the decentralized space at all, they just got hammered. They are just such a large target. Now, we have a lot of miners in the US that have grown to the size, you know, through investment, through acquisition um, and going public. They're to the size now where they are very, very large targets for governments to start you know, regulating more heavily. If we can draw the line and say they are a utility and they are producing hash power and they are selling off this hash power to a global grid, I think we stand a chance at avoiding the censorship piece. 
but it's <laughs> it's going to be tricky, right? So we're trying to make the case that says, you know, what power plant uses all of their electricity as their own customer? It just it doesn't exist. So we want the same model with these mining facilities. They produce hash power. They sell it off to an open grid, and mining pools and institutions and you know other large entities that want to get into the Bitcoin mining space, they bid against each other on an open marketplace in order to purchase the hash power to create Bitcoin blocks. That's really the vision that we want to see fulfilled. And I think, again, what's interesting is that it's not a conceptual argument being laid out by a lobby group, you know, in a Senate hearing, right? You know, we should treat this as a commodity, you know, it shouldn't be treated as a payments provider, you know, you're not necessarily facilitating a transaction, but you're kind of technically solving this. So, you know, you're effectively abstracting that debate away entirely for people that have hash power and that want to provide hash power to net, into the network. Yeah, that's the goal, right? There's other solutions out there. You know, one of them was Jack Dorsey coming forward and saying, you know, we're going to do this new uh, type of stratum. And it's essentially very similar to what Slush was doing with their stratum to V2, where the miners get to select the transactions, which is fine too. That's, that's a good solution. The problem is the members of that solution all have to be aligned with the core beliefs, right? And what we're seeing with the crew around Jack Dorsey's solution, and I think Luke Jr. is in on that one too, they seem to be very against things like ordinals. So then their nodes won't process. And I was just talking to someone about this yesterday, where their nodes actually won't process certain transactions that have ordinals in them. So it's very, very interesting that we, you know, in the name of being censorship resistant, we are finding ways to censor. I've gotten several conversations with people that say, you know, ordinals are spam, they're bloating, you know, the blocks and they're driving up transaction fees and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, decentralized network is only as good as the users using it. And if the majority of the users that are using Bitcoin want to use it for ordinals, then Bitcoin is an ordinal network. You know, and that's just the way a decentralized network works. If the people want to use it a certain way, then that's what it's used for. And the moment anyone tries to step in and try to curtail the usage of a, you know, or try to manipulate a behavior, you know, that's exactly what governments do. That's exactly, you know, we are all of a sudden no better than the very entities we're trying to be protected from. Yeah. I mean, you know, huge irony and it, permissionless innovation and a permissionless network by definition, is permissionless. It doesn't need anybody's permission to determine how that network can be used. So can we think of Lumarin as agnostic? It's neutral. It, it, you know, it doesn't care where the hash power is coming from, and it doesn't care what it's being used for. Yeah, it's exactly right. It's really data stream agnostic. And that's the goal in building Lumarin was we want to treat a data stream in a way that can be, one, programmable, two, completely agnostic, and three, decentralized and anonymous. So I can take any type of data and I can move it from one socket to another socket, from one system to another system, and do that engagement through a smart contract. So I don't know necessarily the person I'm engaging with. They don't need to know me. But all of the interactions are predefined in the smart contracts. And the Lumeran nodes simply follow the orders. So a seller of hash power will put up a contract saying, I will you know, transmit this much hash power to you over this much time for this amount of money. And if someone purchases that, then that's exactly what the seller's node will do. It follows the orders. And if at any point the buyer's node senses that the seller is not filling the contract according to terms, then the buyer's node can cancel the contract. This is a very, very basic interaction. It's the most boilerplate interaction we could create for a base level marketplace. From there, we want to start moving into things like futures and more of a spot market where a buyer can you know, post a bid, seller can post an act, and then we can start or ask, and then we can start doing more of an order book type matching system. Um, that gets a little more complicated through a decentralized network, as we've seen with Uniswap, but it can be done. Uh, so that's where we're working for the hash power. But because we are actually just doing socket to socket communication, we can really take any data stream and we can turn it into a commoditized asset. So it could be a file, it could be AI compute, it could be audio, it could be, you know, whatever, you know, so we're going to be talking to the guys from Filecoin, we'll be talking to the guys from storage, we'll be talking to the guys that are heading up a lot of the decentralized AI initiatives. 
with the goal of, hey, Lumeron is building a data agnostic proxy system for, you know, interacting through smart contracts for, you know, transmitting data. And we want to start bringing Lumeron into other systems for decentralized data routing. Yeah. And the cool thing with this, of course, is, and I know this is why we got so excited about working with you initially. So worth saying you went through the Ascent program. It wasn't through our Basecamp Accelerator. It's through Ascent, which is a later stage advisory on, on network launch 18 months from now as we're speaking December 23. And you know, the cool thing was this promise of literally turning these decentralized networks into you know, digital commodities markets is something that we constantly talk about. You know, we constantly say that these aren't securities, that they sit outside the scope of the SEC, that maybe it's in the US anyway, the CFTC that should be looking at these things. And really, when we're talking about blockchains, we're talking about digital supply chains in a way. And the reason why large enterprise might want to take positions in this asset class is if they think that blockchains and these networks are going to be integrated into their supply chains in the same way that they would buy futures for any you know fundamental commodities to produce a car or you know any any other kind of output and this here really enables that you know starting with bitcoin starting as you say with these kind of hash power marketplaces but then adding on greater layers of i guess financialization of these assets right yeah we're just now you know scratching the surface of how this is going to function. We have the vision for how it can function for hash power. We have the vision for how it can function for AI compute. Those are very clear use cases. You know, but when we start getting into more edge cases like a decentralized Netflix or a decentralized communication system where if we can leverage things like the Helium network where you have peer-to-peer connectivity, and then we use Lumeron for peer-to-peer communications routing. Now we can completely bypass typical telecom systems. You know, that's the stuff that really starts to get me excited about these projects, where we are building new infrastructure that is all around the idea of a sovereign individual. We're getting away from systems that can be controlled and can be manipulated. You know, soon, hopefully, gone will be the days where, you know, someone can steal your SIM card and steal your identity. Gone will be the days where someone can, you know, hack into your account with a password. You know, right now, we're really at a loss for even authentication. You know, where most systems now are trying to authentic using two factor authentication, authenticate back to your email or authenticate back to your phone number. Because a lot of websites are like, wow, well, our website's not secure enough. So we're just going to assume someone's phone is secure. We're going to assume, you know, Google has it covered. So we're going to assume that their email is secure. And they're just kicking the can down the road on security and, you know, authentication. It's really just silly the way we're, we're building our identity systems. So I, I'm really excited about you know what we're doing with Lumeron, what some other projects are doing. And I really can see a lot of the puzzle pieces coming together to really have tamper resistant systems where a government can't come in and you know freeze your bank account. They can't freeze your assets. They can't take your phone number from you. They can't uh, go through your emails. That's where we want to be. So we went live, as I said, you know, the network went live I think July 22, token is LMR, the hash power marketplace went live in September. So that's 23 to 22, 23. Tell us about the roadmap. Tell us about the stack that's been executed on so far. A lot's been achieved. You guys have just been head down whilst everything crazy has been going on in the market, which I've loved seeing. And, you know, now I, I think now people are going to increasingly kind of catch on to, to what you guys have been working on. But just give us an update of the stack, you know, the network, uh, any growth metrics, and then, of course, like the roadmap, what you've got planned for the next year and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just I'll lead by saying keeping your head down through the, the bear market and staying focused is very, very difficult because there's so many times where you like you poke your head out of the code and you start looking around going, should we still be doing this? Should we kind of like pivot and do something else? Like maybe it's a mistake to keep like forging ahead. You know, the, the markets are down, you know, and I mean, the obvious one would have been AI, right? You know, that, that would have been the obvious pivot for you, you know, at eight months ago would be like, okay, you know, scrap this crypto stuff. Let's just, 
redivert what we've been doing to, to AI. It's very, very tempting. And a lot of people did that. You know, it was the kind of the, the new shiny object on the block. So let's let's go chase that. And a lot of startups did that. And a lot of projects kind of aban- abandoned what they were focused on and pivoted. We decided to stick the course. And we see that Bitcoin isn't going anywhere. And we see that the problem still resides around centralization. It hasn't been solved. And we really set our focus on getting the system together. So uh, yeah, two years in the making, we got the marketplace launched in September and it was difficult. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not easy. And even the, the first rendition, even though we had tested it 50 different ways, we had you know, test net going from March of 2023 all the way to September. Uh, we had about 16,000 people in the community you know, jumping in and out, giving us feedback hammering our Telegram t- channel, hammering our Twitter. We were getting uh, all sorts of uh, flack from people because we had done our uh, token sale and we had launched the community about two years prior. So we had a lot of people just hammering on us, you know, of like, oh, this was a scam, this was a rug pull or whatever. And the whole time, you know, we have this team of 10, 12 engineers you know, we have daily standups. We're we're just plugging away at the code for two years. So finally, it felt so good to launch, and it was kind of like this vindication, right? Where people just like bang on you for two years of like, oh, it's a scam, it's a rug pull, it's whatever, and then we just get to push and release like just mountains of code, and it's all been tested, and it just works. And it was such a great feeling. And it wasn't like, oh, download this uh, daemon system and configure all this stuff. Like, no, we had a GUI right out of the box with an integrated wallet. The marketplace was integrated. The buyer and the seller experience were all out of the same user interface. It was really a huge feat by the team to get all this launched simultaneously. Now, it didn't mean there weren't technical issues. We still, you know, it, it is a very technical thing. We're, we're doing real-time hash power routing, and we're trying to communicate this to the community where, you know, a lot of the people in the community are used to Web3 stuff where they'll connect their MetaMask wallet in a UI, and then they'll just click some buttons, and it just magically works for them, you know? And they're not used to there's a big disconnect between what they're actually doing behind the scenes and in the code and then what the results are in their metamask and in this little DeFi portal so when all of a sudden you know they get a transaction stuck or whatever they freak out because they don't really know what's going on behind the scenes well with lumeran when you're purchasing hash power you are streaming real you know hash power through your machine so we're constantly emphasizing to the community that look, this is not something you're going to do on your phone. This is not something that you really should even be doing on your laptop. If you're going to be buying real hash power, there are real financial implications to your laptop turning off or getting disconnected. So you need to have a stable connection and a stable machine that's going to have 99.99% uptime. And then there's you know the port forwarding and the firewalls and all the other things that people are going to be streaming through their personal computer. So so yeah, hats off to the team for the amazing technical lift. That's where we are caught up to now, end of September. Before you go into that, because I think it's really important to acknowledge how trying that is for a founder, a CEO, really, you know, you're motivating a team, a team that are, as you say, kind of going, is this really the direction, you know, we should be going, you know, you're kind of weighing up different alternatives. Of course, there's always financial pressures, especially if you've got a live token, you know, you're looking at your treasury, you know, your notional treasury, it kind of depleted, right? So we had a lot of people buy in with Polkadot. Polkadot was $39 a coin, right? Look at it today. Like if that gives you any idea of the heart attack we had with our treasury, like trying to know how to manage that, it's brutal. Yeah. And look, you know, we've seen it several times. So, I, you know, I remember at least two cycles, you know, the, the biggest one was obviously kind of coming into 18 and, and 19, where the whole market tanks. And if you've got a live network with a live token, it doesn't matter what you were doing, you know, it's down 90% in value. Sinking tides, you know, sink all ships. And everyone's lost a load of money, not necessarily on any one token, but just in aggregate, everyone's angry. You know, some people are you know, going from feeling like they're a financial genius to feeling like, you know, they're kind of a victim. You know, sovereignty sucks when you lose. It's great when you win. And so everyone's angry. And actually, the more unsophisticated the person that, you know, held that asset, usually the more angry they are because they don't technically understand what's going on. You know, they don't technically understand 
what the, the progress that's been made, or they can't differentiate between a genuine, you know, rug pull and a team that kind of heads down, working incredibly hard. And that's just the noise that's coming at you. You know, I, I won't mention names, but you know, we've had protocols in the past that founders are getting death threats. You know, if you go on this stage in this country, you know, I'm going to kill you. And you know, they're, they're getting that whilst they're. <laughs> You know, sat writing some code, trying to ship product, trying to motivate a team. So I can't empathize with that enough. And to be able to have steered a team, steered a ship, kept everyone focused, and as you say, executed something not like the minimal that you can execute to prove, hey, you know, we've somehow delivered on a promise to SAFT holders or investors, but to kind of actually ship something that you're really proud of that you think is a step change should be acknowledged. So just before we go into the next bit, like I don't think people realize the pressure that that puts on a founder. So, you know, hats off Ryan for, um, for navigating that. Thank you. You know, I, I have to say too, like when times are good and the market's up, you know, and you have a good treasury to work out of and you're, you're kind of plotting your course and you start scaling your team. And, you know, at one point we had scaled the team up to like 35 people you know, and, and times were good. And the moment the market turns, you start having to make some really hard decisions. Everyone let people go last year, you know? It's brutal. Worst part of the job, worst part of the project is having to make those hard decisions. And knowing that, you know, all those people had a hand in the code and they all were pushing with, you know, with everyone else. So it's almost like I can't even put words behind like how thankful I am to all these guys because, you know, we, we did have over 35 people on the team at one point, and now we're down to like 12. So there's, you know, 20, 23 people that had pushed with us for over a year. And, you know, now they got picked up by other companies, other projects, and, you know, hopefully they're all doing really well. But it was an immense amount of effort that went into getting to this point. And we're still pushing, you know, and I kept telling the team, like, look, we are just trying to get to the starting line. We haven't even started yet, you know, and we have a community of like 16,000 people hitting us up, trying to like, hey, you know, where's the software? Where's the updates? Where's this at? Where's that at? You know, and, and finally we launched. We saw it reflect in the markets. Obviously, the community was, you know, beside themselves happy. The vindication was amazing. But it was the starting line. And now all of a sudden we have all these uh, you know, bugs coming in and we, our technical debt and backlog just is growing exponentially. So the work did not get easier after we launched. It got actually exponentially harder because now we have a live system out there and we're having to triage certain um, issues that we're finding. Um, so the team did an incredible job over the past couple months um, to work with the community, um, get all the feedback, triage the different bugs and the updates. Um, and we did a huge uh, technical update about a week, week and a half ago now, which was our first actual ne or our first release since launch at the end of September. The system got so much better, so much more, you know, more stable. Um, and that's, you know, reflecting with the community now. So we're in a really good place with the cycle, with the community, with the feedback that we're getting. And of course, you know, you've got a great team over there that are going to really kind of start ramping that up now. The tech's ready for prime time. So tell us a little bit about the roadmap ahead, you know, what you're looking to roll out in 24 and maybe even just like, you know, the very quick ABC, one, two, three of how people can begin to participate in the network. What's the basic requirement they could be thinking about? Yeah. So the, the biggest thing right now is scaling. So the core is there and now it's engaging the large miners and helping them understand the utility model. So a lot of the miners will look at this decentralized marketplace and they'll say, oh, that's instability and that's risk that we don't wanna take. We're not gonna put our hash power up for sale on this marketplace because one, we don't know who we're selling to, and two, you know, we need stable payouts every 24 hours for our accounting team. So what we've been doing and presenting is as a Lumeran community and as, as Titan as a pool, we've been engaging large miners to put together uh, purchase contracts where we will purchase large amounts of hash power from miners and partner with them uh, in order to give them the stable payouts they need on a pre-calculated basis and then use that hash power to back things like the Titan mining pool, the Lumeran hash power marketplace, and really help scale the ecosystems. 
And then there's one other thing, actually, I, I totally forgot to mention because it was kind of a side project that I brought up with one of our pool engineers last year. He actually pulled it together pretty fast and we, we put a really slick UI on it, but we haven't really done that much announcement or marketing around it. And it's actually the Titan Lightning Pool. And what it is, and, and this was actually solving a problem for the Lumeron community because a lot of uh, people in the Lumeron community would download the node, they'd purchase hash power, but they don't have a mining pool account because they're not miners. So they would go to F2 pool or they'd go to slush pool, they'd sign up for a mining pool account, but then they'd be mining with, you know, anywhere from 100 tera hash to a peta hash for you know a couple of days but that wasn't enough hash power to hit the threshold for a withdrawal from these pools so it was posing this problem where you know people testing out in the community could see the hash power hitting their pool account but they were never making enough money to actually get real bitcoin into their wallet so i talked to the pool and our pool engineer jethro and he created the titan lightning pool so now when you onboard into lumeron you can either put in your pool credentials or you could just drop in your lightning address. And if you drop in your lightning address, then the hash power will flow right into the Titan lightning pool and you'll get paid out nearly instantaneously in sats by sats, every share that flows into the pool. So you'll just start seeing a stream of payouts hit your lightning wallet. And it's one of the most gratifying experiences to be able to click buy in a marketplace, see hash power hit your node and seconds later see sats hitting your wallet. It's like this instantaneous stream Web3 token into Bitcoin. Well, look, I mean, I think that's the best way to end, right? Because I think, you know, that's just an example of the potential for this and how anybody can participate, you know, or end of the spectrum. And I think, you know, Ryan, a lot of the audience will appreciate, I mean, look, the potential of this is huge. You know, I think naturally the timing of this is perfect. You know, 24 is going to be an exciting year for you. But just from a founder perspective, you know, hearing your journey through that cycle, you know, your honesty and humility, I know that we'd have really appreciated that. So thanks for sharing that aspect of, of the Lumeran story. And maybe to kind of just close off, uh, how can people get involved? Where do they go? How can they get started? With Lumeran, it's only going to go anywhere if people actually get involved. You know, over the past year, Alexa and the, the marketing team have done an incredible job with engaging the community. And we've seen over 16,000 people sign up and get involved. If you know you have a knack in the the marketing space or graphic design or dev or you just want to you know kick the tires and give us some feedback, you can go to lumerin.io. That's l-u-m-e-r-i-n.io. You can download the node. You can join the Telegram channel. Start asking questions. Start getting involved. We're just now starting this race, and uh, there's a lot to be done. So. If this interests you at all, if you're interested in uh, Bitcoin and keeping it decentralized, then definitely we'd love to have you in the community. Amazing. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. Have a great break as well over the Christmas. Thanks, Jamie. 